Uh, so this is a paper about corporate disclosures and carbon emissions. It's a co-work paper with uh, Philip Kruger. And before we get started with the paper itself, I would like to start with uh, an example. Um, assume you're an investor and you want to invest in a firm. You have the choice between two firms, okay? And because you're a good guy, you want to invest in the firm with the lowest emissions. So the two firms are identical in all ways, but on their carbon emissions, okay? And so you take the financial reports of these firms and you go to the section on greenhouse gas emissions and this is what you find. And you realize that it's not easy to choose which firms are the lowest emissions. While firm one choose percentage reduction year on year, firm two shows an absolute reduction of a different time period. So that at the end of the day, it's quite impossible to find which firms are the lowest emission. Now, same exercise with this kind of information. And here, you see that it's easier to find which firm has the lowest emission. And it's easier because we have standardized information, namely scope one, and scope two, and matrix ton. And we also have uh, intensity ratio, okay, which is basically a ratio of total emissions over a quantifiable factor such as sales or assets. So what's my point? My point is that these four screenshots all come from the financial reports of two firms, Tensco and Unilever, and yeah, the only difference is one year. While in 2012 we have non-standardized information, in 2013 we have standardized information. So what, what happened? What happened? The United Kingdom passed a law called the Companies Act 2006 Regulations 2013, that I'm going to call simply the regulation, okay? And what does this regulation do? It mandates firms to disclose, so it mandates firms listed on the main market of the London Stock Exchange to disclose some information. These information are scope one and scope two emissions, and this emissions intensity. Importantly, this information on carbon emission must be disclosed in the financial reports. Okay, so in my opinion, at this date, this regulation is quite unique in that it is very prescriptive about what kind of this information and where the information need to be disclosed. In particular, it's not only for big firms with high emissions, it's for all firms, okay? It's not that firms have to choose a ratio that they think is relevant to put in their responsibility reports, but it's uh, very clear what kind of information must be uh, reported. So we have this regulation in 2013, and I think we may agree on the fact that it makes it easier for everyone to compare firms, okay? So the big question is what happened to the greenhouse gas emissions? Did we decrease, did we increase? Would it remain stable? So what's what we're going to do in this paper? We study the effect of this uh, regulation. And we're going to ask two main questions. The first one is whether, whether the regulations lead to a reduction in emission. And the second, why is, is the second one is why. Let's start with some prima facie evidence, and let's look at the disclosure rate. So disclosure rate is a rate that means do I have the information on total greenhouse gas emission for a firm in a given year? And for this exercise, we're gonna compare UK firms to European firms. So UK firms are firms impacted by the regulations, while European firms are firms listed in the main stock European, sorry, for the main European stock markets in like 11 countries in Europe. So if you do that, you see that before the regulations on the left of the gray line, we have similar training disclosure rates. And in 2013, we have a change in the trend for UK firms, such that in 2016, almost 
100% of UK film reports their emissions and only 40% for urban films. So we have this shock in availability, we have this shock in comparability. What about the emissions? If you look at now the absolute emissions, which is simply the level of emissions, we found a steady decrease in emission from 2013. For operant films, it's unclear. So in a climate change point of view, it's relevant to look at absolute emissions, uh, but in an economic or financial point of view, it's perhaps more relevant to look at relative emissions. And what we do is to look at, it, we take the ratio of emission of tangible assets. And here we find an, em, an even more dramatic decrease in emission for UK films. So these three graphs show simply that a shock in uh, comparability, a shock in standardization of information, just this, lead to a decrease in emissions, which is a good news, I think. But of course, you might be wondering. You might be wondering that all the thing may explain these three graphs. For instance, industry. It might be that a big industry in UK drive the emissions down. It might be some difference of size. It might be that UK firms are bigger or smaller, such that it's easier for them to reduce their emissions. Or simply about time trends. Simply the reduction in emissions for UK is a result of a long-term uh, decrease in emissions. So to uh, address this concern, we use the, the difference in difference in specification. We look at the differential in emission, relative or absolute, between European and UK firms. We compare this differential before and after the regulations, and we control for size, include uh, fixed effects such as industry fixed effects and year fixed effects. So now we, are, we can cleanly estimate whether the regulations lead to a decrease in emissions. What we find is that following the regulation, UK firm reduced their emission by approximately 16% uh, relative to European firm. And this big decrease is mainly explained by a uh, reduction in scope to emissions. What we also do is to uh, analyze to estimate this differential year over year around the regulation. Here's the main idea is that we would like a causal impact of the regulation. So the idea is that absent of the regulation, the differential in emissions between European and UK firm should have been the same. And as you can see, before the regulation, the differential between European and UK firms are virtually uh, equivalent, we are non significantly different from zero. And after the regulation, we have a dramatic decrease in emission. So this graph shows that, suggests, I would say, that the regulation has a causal impact on emissions. So, so far we have compared UK firms to the average urban firms. What about a wide by wine comparison, comparing UK films to Spanish films, for instance, or French films. Um, so that's what we did. And here's a map shows so brand countries are countries in which films reduce less their emission than UK films. And blue and green countries are countries in which films listed in these countries uh, reduce less, their, uh, more of their emission, they are cleaner, uh, countries to some extent. And the first thing you may notice is that there isn't a lot of blue and green countries, so, and when we have a differential, this is not significant. So my point is that the regulations lead to a decrease in emissions, but this is not a small decrease in emission. This is among the largest reduction in Europe over the period 2013-2016. Okay, so it's time to sum for the first question. So, UK firms reduce both their relative and absolute emission following the regulations, and there is a suggest a causal impact, as reduction is among the largest in Europe. But of course, you may be wondering why. Why would firms already disclosing their information before the regulation 
would reduce their emission following the regulations. That's a work in progress, but we have some, uh, I would say, some results, uh, some uh, hypotheses. Um, the first hypothesis is that perhaps we have investor pressure because uh, it's easier for investors to compare firms over time and on the cross-section. Uh, this investor may easily implement trading strategy based on emissions and affect the price, the stock prices of these firms and, and the cost of capital. And what we find is that after regulation for UK firms, the higher the emission of the firm, the lower his value and his higher his cost of capital. So it suggests that we have some pressure for investors. But there is something else. We also think that with the pressure for stakeholders, um, and for instance, we find that for B2C industries, so business to customers industry, uh, this industry reduce even more the emissions that other industry, suggesting that we have some pressure also from customers. And we also thought about uh, alternative stories. For instance, we control for economic growth. We control for accounting changes in the EU ETS, the emission trading system, or even for temperature. And we, found, uh, we also test for alternative uh, specification, including uh, different fixed effects. And each time we find a significant uh, reduction in emission for uh, UK firms. So the main takeaways of this study, I think, is that these prescriptive regulations leads to an increase in availability of emission data. Of course, so this is uh, clearly obvious because firms have to comply with the regulation, but this is not trivial, I think. Um, the best way to manage something is to have data on this. So this is good to have. Uh, more data on uh, emissions. The second thing is that it reduces uh, both uh, relative and absolute level uh, of emissions. Um, and I think it's good news, again, because I'm not talking about any taxes here. Um, you know, I don't say that because I'm French, but we know that some countries don't really like taxes. And so it might be at least a part of the solution to reduce a bit um, the emissions. If also why question, why film reduce the emission? Well, it's still a work in progress, but we have some evidence that standardized information make it easier for investors and customers to compare film. So if you really want to know why film reduce the emission following the regulations, simply follow our paper on assessor. <laughs> Thank you very much.